All right, so uh, it's uh, 12.30, I guess we can start. How many of you folks here are from uh, ops side of things? Like system admins, uh, the deployment managers, whatever. Uh, so I assume rest of it developers, right? So developers, any, any few? Oh, yeah, okay, so good. Um, I think this is, talk will be specifically interesting for developers because the observability and all these new terms is just the way how we can get excited developers about like uh, doing monitoring of their stuff, right? Um, and a uh, couple things uh, before we start. This is me. You can find me on Twitter. My name is Victor. You can definitely uh, go and follow me there. You can uh, tweet about the sessions using these hashtags. And uh, this is the company where I'm working. I work as a developer advocate at a company called Confluent. Confluent is the company that started by uh, creators of Apache Kafka. Anyone heard about Apache Kafka? Good, good. Um, so yeah, and we built uh, the best managed service that's available there for Apache Kafka. Uh, we built the best distribution of Apache Kafka, naturally. And, and we're also providing different uh, the services around this. So enough of that. Um, about a little bit my, about myself uh, as a developer advocate. This is what I do essentially. So you should expect demo that will consist of like a highly scalable kernel world application that will uh, show some of the things. And uh, actually, this um, this particular title was coined by uh, Kenny Bastani, um, and props to him. Hopefully, he's in a good health right now. So I do have a. Uh, Ruffle here. If you would like to participate, it's easy. You need to follow me. You, you need to follow Confluent, post its pictures, tag me in these pictures, hashtag Oracle code, and I will find you. It'll give you, most likely, it's going to be a gift card. All right, so uh, enough of that. So we can start to actual topic. All right, so um, since you are developers here, we know how everything started. We're starting with small PUC. We're writing some, some of the system. We're starting with, with something small. We're just trying and seeing how the things will work. Some of the small module that will prove the certain, uh, certain framework works. Some of the uh, uh, new language that you're learning is working, and you might be uh, doing some of the things. And over the time, you actually start adding more since your requirements start growing. You're gaining more and more uh, the modules in your system. And it's still manageable for one person because you kind of can fit all these modules, all the subsystems with your head. Um, so in this case, it's, it is still manageable. Now, this, over time, it grows into um, different, um, um, different sizes of subsystems and things getting bigger and bigger and it's getting darker and darker because it's, it's much more difficult to keep things uh, in the head of uh, one or two or a team of developers. It's, it's becoming a very, very unpleasant place and at some, at some point you might even find some dead code, someone try to hide some of the, uh, some of the daily secrets and whatnot in the system. So, and when you're trying to explain this to someone, to a new person who joins your team, or the person who's trying to operate this in the production, if you're not employing um, the, uh, the DevOps practices, you might sound like this. Uh, you will try to explain every possible path in your system if it's not well organized or it's not well uh, designed. Because you, you, you build a system. You was very busy of building system, right? Uh, you was be very busy of um, bringing value <laughs> into your company. And uh, over time, you start kind of outsourcing this uh, knowledge to different systems that will take uh, care of uh, half of the system. And uh, essentially how we did this uh, for a while in the past, right, uh, does things like uh, Zabbix, Nagios, does it ring a bell to some of the developers? Usually if it's operations people in the room, they yeah, yay, Nagios, we still remember it. So essentially every system, if you're using enterprise system, like using some vendor system, will usually ships with own set of, um, of uh, monitoring tools, set of dashboards, and uh, you need to learn this or like your operations people need to learn this. So, and different systems, they have different notion of monitoring, different uh, things that they monitor, allow to monitor and different things 
that they um, different, different, probably different opinion about what they monitor and how they monitor it. Um, and uh, usually, before DevOps uh, become a thing, before uh, the cultural shift in organizations, when when you start owning the code that will be running in production, we just call it some IT stuff. Like we just like giving to IT guys, they will monitor, they will set up alerts, and they will have a they will be a, on uh, on duty, and the, someone will call them if the system will go down. And after that, through the escalation path, they will kind of sort of end up um, and learn. Uh, who, who's responsible for this code or who wrote this code, right? Um, and uh, it's very difficult to say, like, application can report it's still alive. For example, it has some of the set of uh, HTTP probes, the easiest thing, and uh, this HTTP probe will always respond to 100. Yeah, application is alive, but connection to database is broken. Um, because your, your system not only represents like your, your system or your web app or, or whatnot, it also represents uh, connection to multiple other systems, including databases, matching the system, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, how many of you have been in this uh, so-called war rooms? Have uh, like a big table and the people look like uh, they gathered there for uh, like a Justice League meeting, you know? There's a, there's a Superman sitting in the center of the room, or if, how many of you have seen this uh, Boys uh, TV show recently? There's, a, there's a, another character which is mocks Superman, it's called um, Homelander, he's always uh, so powerful. And he sits and he has the power to, you know, to fire, or to kill. so it's basically a blame game, right? And the different people come into this war room and say, oh, uh, so our system is working fine, it's not our fault, and the different other people are coming, so, and uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it reminds like a war room because they're trying to figure out what the hell is going on. Um, everything starts like, like, like this. Um, you have a customer that calls in and uh, you're trying to figure out why their system is not working. And this um, red line represents the time, essentially, where your customer is complaining, your customer is not happy, to the point where you can say, uh, we, yeah, yeah, we're fixing. But this time for troubleshooting, can take days, weeks, hours, who knows? Because sometimes fix is simple. Developer, as a developer, you can say, oh, we can ship the patch like right now. I can just go to production and just replace few classes there just manually. How many of you have done this before? Just go there, you pass your CI CD pipeline, you just compile this new Java class, just went there, just drop it in the class path without even packing to, to jar. I did this, I, I was a consultant, I did this all the time. Um, do, I ha do, do I proud of this? No, but it helps some people go to sleep so we can work on the root cause analysis, uh, root cause analysis and figure out the problems after uh, and try to not allow these things to happen. You know, there's some situation where you need to fix something, right? Just go and fix it, the customers will be happy, we can go have a couple hours of sleep and after that we will figure out how we're not allowed to um, to make this. And what the DevOps is actually teaching us is not a blame game anymore, right? So all the things where deploy often, deploy often, deploy your code, like every commit, every push, it teaches you that changes that are not that, uh, um, not that scary. They're not supposed to be scary because with the proper culture of delivering these things and the proper culture of monitoring we will return to monitoring observability and how they connect it. Changes are not scary anymore, right? Yep, this is something that we don't like, right? So the, this situation is not, not, not super cool. So let's, uh, let's go to the subject of observability. So I established this importance that uh, probably you already know that this is important thing to know. And uh, yeah, this uh, term of observability, um, it's just a fancy word to get uh, developers excited about the thing. You know, developers, the backend engineers, they care about performance, they care about some of the um, instrumentation, uh, um, like uh, real-time performance metrics collection, blah, 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 but essentially um, providing the ways how you can collect useful information to make a decision that something is working or something is, is not working, right? So this is 
what essentially we're going to be talking about. Observability uh, has or resides on top of three pillars. And by the way, um, the um, Cindy, she's, uh, she's authored a very awesome book about um, uh, distributed tracing and uh, observability. And uh, some of the ideas specifically about the pillars of observability they also were borrowed from, from that book. So let's start with, um, uh, with these three pillars of observability. This is the first pillar. Who can tell me what is that? It's not biceps. What he is carrying? A lock, okay, so maybe this is makes more sense for you, right? So you, this is something that you can relate, you know what is this. So log, what is log? Log is a sequence of uh, timestamp events. Usually it is immutable, unless you're trying to, you know, hide something or, you know, stole some money from your, for, from your, from your boss and after that you can hide this, uh, go and uh, edit this log. But usually logs are immutable. So a couple things we have here is, again, time. We know that something happened within a particular moment of time. Uh, we can also say what was the uh, severity level and the component that uh, provided this. Usually info allows you to restore a sequence of events. You know that, okay, so everything's good, everything's good. And after that, you've seen something, we don't see errors here. Warnings. Warnings mean that we need to pay attention to something. And um, usually logs are giving idea or giving history of the events that happened with the particular service. Um, in order to make sense of the things that happen in the system in whole, you need to um, introduce a new discipline. It's a log aggregation. So, and after that, based on time, and based on certain things that happened within this time period, you can create this correlation between how different system behaved uh, in a, this uh, moment of time. So in this case, um, the, the log aggregation will allow you to kind of establish uh, one to many relationship, like how many systems were, were um, involved in this particular incident. Second pillar, uh, metrics. Everybody loves metrics. Um, in the contrary to, to logs, metrics describe not the individual event, but they uh, describe certain things that happen in aggregation, right? So within five minutes, we can say that total throughput of particular the socket or particular uh, the channel on uh, our message bus was X. And this is something that is not applicable to our um, SLA to external customer or to our SLO. Um, and uh, so we're seeing that, okay, these metrics are actionable, so we need to take some sort of action based on the, these breaches. So, so in this case, like you have a time, um, time slice and you can uh, figure out um, what you know. So what we know right now, the whole history of things, and we have uh, the metrics that gives you some like aggregating thing that will give you um, certain view to the system. However, when we're dealing, uh, always remember we start how we started here. So we started with the small things. Yeah, we brought a small service. Our small service has logs we can get and download all these logs to investigate all these problems. We can actually collect some metrics. We can use either framework or write the metric um, collector ourselves and uh, so collect certain actionable metrics. You know, people love metrics. People, I, um, people, I would like to ask every time when I'm in a room with the, uh, with the, with the users of Kafka, and um, since I, I, was, I was working as a, a professional services engineer here at Confluent for a while, people want to know what the metrics they need to measure. And they love, love to see all these dashboards. It's another, it's another thing that uh, engineers love to see. But some of the things that you, I want you to have in mind, like two things actually. The first things you need to figure out what metrics are actionable and what metrics are not actionable. You need to know, okay, you see this throughput dropping, but what it, does it tell you? Do you know, like, is it, uh, is it permanent? Is, is it a spike? Is it happening? Is it pattern? 
you don't know. And another thing that do you really care about certain metrics? Yes, they, they might be out of certain boundaries, but do you really care? So it's not always, if you're thinking about metrics, collecting metrics, yeah, it's good, it's nice, it's, it's better not to have those, but you always think that all those metrics require me to call someone in the middle of the night because something is misbehaving. For example, uh, we have um, engineers, uh, the, the, the support engineers who work on managing some Kafka infrastructure. They have a huge experience of managing messaging systems and they also trying to translate their past knowledge to, to things that uh, they have with Kafka, for example. Uh, and one of the things is that they see in the messaging system, the JMS or Rabbit or whatnot, they see that number of messages in particular topic is increasing. And after that, they start calling to developers and hey, looks like this application is not doing something right, okay? It's, it's a number of messages and topic is increasing. But in Kafka world, it's okay, it's fine because Kafka, it's, it's kind of like a database. It can accumulate messages and messages will not disappear after someone will acknowledge those. And all these things that, yeah, he, he sees this number of messages in topic is growing. Is it actionable? He thought it was actionable because on the, his previous experience, it was actionable because it's the indicator of something bad, but it's not necessarily true. Um, and the third pillar that we're gonna be focusing right now is the um, tracing, and specifically distributed tracing that allows us to have a whole picture of the uh, certain request or certain uh, piece of code will be executed in parallel with some other bits of your application. Now, uh, tracing is a very nice tool that allows you to establish cause and um, uh, the, the, in the result, uh, the, uh, the relationship. So your systems, uh, you will be able to figure out that this is something that happened or time took so much time that uh, like it affected certain things on our, our application. Uh, we always know what kind of service involved. Usually it's kind of like a swim lanes that define um, what kind of service spent certain time doing such and such things. We know, we'll know how much, uh, how long it takes the service to do things. And uh, where actually, you know, failure happened. Um, and after that, you can still apply all the things that you already have. You can still go and investigate what a certain service uh, failed through the logs. You can go and drill down and see all this kind of log, log information. Um, interesting observation, I, I recently, I recently uh, uh, saw in some of the presentation that was done in, uh, a week ago at the Strange World. Obs uh, the distributed tracing is like Chrome developer tools, but for something else, not for web apps. How many of you have seen the Chrome developer tools? How many of you have seen the network side of the Chrome developer tools. And you know, you've seen this kind of like how much request will take, how much it takes to um, download image, how much it takes to download CSS. It's a cool thing, but how we can get this from your uh, distributed system. Um, so the, the way how uh, this uh, understanding of the things and the, the way how um, this um, evolution of thinking about the system or making sense about the system um, happened is through the way how we understand cons uh, the concurrency. Uh, I'm oversimplifying uh, over certain things here, but let's start with something simple. We have a web server, uh, run some PHP code. From this PHP code, you establish database connection. Uh, you go into this database. You're getting some result from this database uh, um, and uh, rendering the result is in the HTTP page. So everything happens within one request. Easy to trace. You click the button, your PHP code executed, your database uh, code uh, will throw error, and you know that this is where you failed. It's easy to, to understand, it's easy to figure out where the problem is. Now, the um, enter the world of enterprise Java. So the enterprise Java allows us to run multi-threaded code without thinking about threads per se, right? So the, you know that um, the container will provide you with certain resources, so your code will be executed there. Um, 
and uh, you're not uh, managing your threads there because the threads uh, were not, like managed threads were not the part of specification for a while and some of the implementations might provide you with the, some managed threads, but dif di difficult to figure out. Again, you are, it's still one system, still in the, con uh, in the context of one uh, Java E uh, container, Java E application server, you still can go and uh, look up into uh, in the logs and figure out what is going on, what is the, what is the problems here. Now, enter to the world of uh, Node.js where we don't have a, the, the threading per se at all because it's going to be, it's happening in, every, in, the, in the one loop, in the one thread, and there's going to be con different uh, context uh, switch uh, between, uh, between the things. And there's also kind of things getting, getting complex because it's a, uh, Code becomes asynchronous. You cannot just call something, and after that, based on how fast this method will return, you can say, yeah, this method was fast, because you don't know how fast it will return, because usually you just call it, and after that you have a listener, you have a handler that will be called by underlying, um, underlying runtime. And now we're in a world where all the people on the conferences including myself, telling you that, hey, monolith is bad. You need to build uh, microservices. Microservices is awesome. Microservices is something that you build and uh, with the uh, pizza, uh, pizza box size teams, you have uh, uh, two people who can eat the box of pizza, so yeah, they will build uh, your microservice. Um, now, this microservice needs to communicate. Microservices, they need to talk to different microservices. As many of you know that uh, having shared state and database is a bad thing, so that's why each microservice will have its own database. How you will synchronize these changes, maybe there would be some underlying the backbone we're gonna be talking about in a bit um, that allows to, to replicate this data from one place to another. So how we can trace it, like how the call from one system, uh, how we can trace from the place where like one system will call um, something, another system will uh, reply. So situation like, um, like this. So we, again, ba back to the picture, back, back to this like a small, uh, uh, a beautiful uh, flower with tiny uh, uh, thorns. We start simple. Our microservices has its own state, its, a, its own database. Our microservices need to talk to different applications, maybe expose some of the APIs or calling some APIs. Um, maybe upload some of the data to data warehouse for, for analytics. Um, and uh, integrating with third-party tools that might be not even on-prem, somewhere that you don't have a control over quality and uh, you can rely on certain contractual um, the things that your, your customer will provide. But, uh, you don't have any other control. So you, you're building these things um, in the fashion that other people are building. You're building this, and now go trace that, right? So go figure out where, or like a, someone brought you some bad data, or someone, uh, or you maybe affect some other system. How you can trace it? How we would know that? Um, so this is why we kind of focusing on uh, on the building this thing, what we call streaming platform, and Apache Kafka is the foundation of this streaming platform that allows to establish um, central place of exchange of information. So that's why microservices can communicate through this bus. It's, some of you might be remembering the time of uh, ESBs, but I think it's a little bit different because ESBs were more about messaging means and uh, the way how you can route things. But uh, streaming platform and Apache Kafka, they also provide the ways how data can be persisted. So you can all get different results from the same data if you do want to change the algorithm, how this data will be, um, will be communicating. So a um, few uh, words about um, Apache Kafka. So what we believe is that um, the what we see, what we see from again, maybe we bias. We have this confirmation bias because we're a Kafka company. We're working with customers who use Kafka, but we increasingly see that uh, Kafka becomes a central place where with people uh, put stuff that they want to share with other teams. 
they not exposing some of the some of the systems through uh, some sort of API. They might distill some legacy system that exposes API, but it would be much um, easier to place them into um, into streaming platform where they can do things. So this is why we're kind of thinking about this, and maybe very soon Kafka is becoming the central neural system of organization to exchange the data. Now, so this is why we go, I'm going to the point where the streaming platform and ob observability of the streaming platform becomes another interesting, uh, challenging task. Not only that this uh, streaming platform provides you tools um, that can, for example, establish your central logging system, and many people use Kafka as their log aggregation system, where they're collecting logs from multiple places, and microservices, some mi micro services, bigger services, some services. Um, so, and uh, this data will arrive through Kafka to some other system that allows you to do uh, something useful with its logs. For example, parse it and provide the ways how you can search certain problems or establish alerts. So it's, it's, interesting, it's interesting problem right now. It becomes an interesting problem because it's more um, chicken, chicken or the egg. So you need to, from one point of view, you need to have a system that allows you to provide observability, and other, you need to have observability of the system that provides you observability. So this is what uh, we're gonna be talking a little bit today. Couple things about um, distributed systems, uh, distributed tracing tools. There are good number of open source tools, and uh, the good thing is that open source is is killing it in a good sense. Like it's, it's it's really good that there's so many open source tools that you can use today for free to do your observability tasks. One of the uh, first um, implementation of this observability pattern, so the distributed test, uh, distributed tracing patterns. Uh, was implementation of Zipkin. After that, uh, Jaeger was um, open source, was developed and open sourced out of Uber. And um, the standard are, are around these systems uh, become um, kind of uh, become a thing. So open tracing and open census, which was like a Google implementation and they now joined the open tracing as well. Um, so the open tracing provides the way how this uh, different systems should implement the tracers, the components that will, or reporters that will be writing data to this dashboard, in this particular case, either uh, Jaeger or Zipkin. Um, cloud providers like Datadog, uh, Datadog um, they also have um, um, kind of open tracing compatible endpoints. So you can switch between different um, same way, same promise with the Jawi, right? So we already uh, fed enough of this uh, standard thingy because, okay, they told us we can switch between different data, uh, between different application stores, but um, in, uh, in reality, it was not that easy. But in practice, we all develop everything on Tomcat and after that run production on the WebSphere. So I would consider this as a, as a win. So this is not not the case with open tracing. It's actually um, it's actually pretty good, and there's a, a, the way how the people communicate over certain capabilities and certain features is actually outstanding. So um, it allows you to follow simple uh, programming, simple enough programming model to um, to integrate this, and uh, with the um, with the rise of uh, container management software like Kubernetes, some of these things become a part of the package. Some of the things have become just something that you're getting out of the box. So the Jaeger uh, was open sourced by uh, Uber and it joins a cloud native software foundation together with where the same place where the Kubernetes is. So the, the ecosystem is growing and uh, integration is better and better. So there's no there's no reason not to use this kind of tool. So, and uh, it's uh, it's also becoming more and more popular in a sense where we have a more and more heterogeneous system and the service meshes. This is another concept that came from this cloud native software foundation and the the idea that your services that necessarily needs to know about the existence of each other. So the service mesh was allows to perform this routing. Those tools also integrated with the um, with the, with the tracing. All right. Now, um, 
so this is where why we're here. So distributed tracing for Kafka. Kafka is quite a popular software. So pretty much every time if you're trying to Google something that will should work with Kafka, you will definitely find because a lot of people use Kafka and a lot of people write different integrations. Since so there's no secret that um, one of the projects that's kind of that um, uh, they have this open tracing uh, GitHub organization and there's the open tracing contrib, which is a place where different uh, people, individuals or companies, they can co contribute their, um, their systems uh, or their, their bits to integrate um, different systems. So in this particular case, if you will start lo looking something like open tracing Kafka client, so in this particular case, you will see this stuff. Um, so what it does, um, uh, it, it's, uh, it supports open tracing API and uh, for Java Java client. So uh, Kafka implemented in uh, Java and Scala, uh, and uh, to my to my pleasure, less and less in Scala, more and more in Java. Um, the uh, the uh, API itself allows you to instrument the consumer and producer. And also, it actually follows two, two, two interesting patterns. The first pattern is actual instrumentation. You build a decorator, you're creating your producer class, and you pass this into this uh, tracing decorator. And after that, um, your, um, it's, it, they, they follow the same interface. You can pass this um, uh, the class whenever you're using this producer, and it will behave as a regular producer. Only one thing, it will be intercepting some of the calls, and will ship this metrics to, um, uh, to Jaeger, for example. Uh, another approach that is more, um, uh, um, if I have an actual slide for this one. Uh, yeah, so the, um, another approach is to use uh, so-called interceptors. So in Kafka, there's a concept of interceptors because Kafka itself don't really care and don't really give you way how you can introspect. So only, re only way how you can uh, um, get some of the information you need to you need to instrument your client. So, and with the standard instru uh, standard interceptors, um, we can actually uh, get some meaningful information. So, the way how the different monitoring tools uh, work, they collect data from a client, producer, and consumer, and uh, report to the monitoring system. In the same way, um, colleague of mine implemented some of the uh, tracing uh, capabilities here for some of the system. Now, the two different things. The first thing, uh, when you're using decorator, you need to have access to actual code. You, you go in there, you're changing the code so this decorator can be used. You can apply things like AOP and uh, kind of like uh, inject this uh, agent and uh, do this in runtime, but it looks like nasty. Uh, another approach is using interceptors is doesn't require you to change the code. Uh, use interceptors is just a configuration change and after that, your application will start, will become instrumented. So that's easy. So um, let's, uh, let's take a look what we're gonna be, uh, what's gonna be doing in this demo. So in this particular case, um, there would be, uh, I will be demonstrating some of the approaches, how we can instrument um, system that um, I do have kind of source code, I can go and uh, do certain things with, and the system where I don't have a source code and I just want to get under the uh, under the hood of this one, so let's um, let's take a look on the uh, on the demo. We still have a plenty of time, so let's let's not break the uh, equipment and stuff. All right, so a um, couple things. Um, do you see it well? All right. So we, um, at, at Confluent, we, uh, as I said, we developed this uh, just distribution, our own uh, package of uh, Apache Kafka. Um, and uh, this one allows us to just simply run this uh, components in one command. We have this uh, Confluent CLI that allows us to, to operate with this one. So um, sometimes when the people get started with the, um, with things like uh, like Kafka, they need to bring like whole family in law. They need to bring Zookeeper. You need to bring Kafka, and after that, you will want to have a place where you're going to be storing your uh, schemas for your data and yada yada yada. So we just ship it in one package. So it's uh, easy to develop in one place uh, using this uh, command line tool. 
Um, second thing, while it's starting, I will show you a um, small application uh, that is um, basically a Spring Boot application. Uh, and this Spring Boot application uh, uses some of the um, some of the integrations that uh, Spring Boot provides for Kafka. So my application just starts. I create a Kafka topic, um, and uh, this is uh, pretty much it. In my application, I do have a producer that will uh, write some data in the Kafka topic, um, and the producer in the Spring uh, Spring Boot uh, world, um, if you ever use Spring Boot, uh, or Spring integration for any system that you need to produce some data, you usually rely on some sort of template. So JDBC template, or admin template, Kafka template. So same, similar, similar model. And the way how it works, uh, again, sprinkle, sprinkle of Spring magic. Um, basically, I have this application config that uh, specifies where is my Kafka running, uh, what kind of uh, name of my application, in some of the things that we will be uh, using. So in this particular case, this, uh, this interceptor classes config will be injected in my producer and it will be injected in my consumer over here. So in this case, all these things will be instrumented and my code doesn't know anything about it. So uh, second thing that uh, we're gonna be using another component that um, will be responsible for um, kind of like the processing part. So we have a producer and consumer, we're writing data and reading data, and we have another microservice that needs to do something with this data. They talk through, uh, to, to, to each other through Kafka. So um, uh, let me do, um, uh, I will show you config change for um, a local sub uh, ksql server. So we're gonna be using this uh, thing called ksql, which is, um, I would say, a uh, stream processing tool for for rest of the world because you don't need to be a programmer in Java. You don't need to learn like Kafka streams. You need to learn like Spark streaming and stuff. Uh, whenever, if you have any memories of your past when uh, when you learn the SQL, you can use SQL to write um, stream processing applications. So um, let me see uh, current. Um, I need to find the place where I put my uh huh. Uh, KSQL, KSQL server, and um, here I will just do some configuration change. So KSQL server provides a, con uh, a KSQL uh, config in the server properties. One of the things that I need to put here by default, it comes with these um, the monitoring interceptors. Uh, in this case, it will be um, possible to integrate with some of the uh, visualization tool that we have. But in this particular case, we don't need that because we already uh, configured this. And I can specify multiple interceptors. So if you're using like a distributed tracing, it doesn't mean you have to drop off your monitoring system. So in this case, I would just need to um, specify those in um, separated by comma. There's two, two different types, producer interceptor and consumer interceptor, just because the API is slightly different. So you need to uh, make them work slightly different. So. Uh, let me save it, and I just do start, uh, so one second. Um, another thing, in order that this uh, simplify things or uh, simplify this integration with this Jaeger guy, um, I need to um, specify this um, service that this particular, um, um, it's called uh, trace, how it's called, tracer, yeah, so we uh, so in, in order to make sense of the things that we do with this application, we need to give some meaningful name. So in this case, we will call it, um, yeah, so the let's call it intercept, let's call it service. So in this case, everything that our application will do, like this particular KSQL application will do, will appear in the Jaeger dashboard uh, with this particular name. And uh, I need to run this Jaeger guy. So. I'm using, uh, I, can, I can run this with Docker. I don't have it here. And just, uh, where is it? Um, I just started this. Docker is uh, just a simple way how I can uh, bring the things in. Um, if, a couple things that I want to show you now. So let me go here. My Jaeger starts, it has some data from, no, okay, so it, it was uh, uh, fresh. Uh, start ksql server and uh, let's see if we have uh, liftoff here and I need to start my 
um, my application, my Spring Boot application. Um, so again, Spring Boot application consuming producing data. Uh, we will be able to uh, to see this in uh, in the Jaeger dashboard in a minute. So if I go here, um, there's a service called Spring Boot. And the way how I registered here in my application is just in the configuration, I should specify that this is global tracer that allows me to integrate with the, um, the Jaeger. This is the name, and after that, um, it will just start reporting through uh, UDP, and uh, since uh, my Jaeger runs here on certain uh, UDP board, it will just capture all this data. Now, what you can see on this console, my producer will write some data and my consumer reads some data from this object. Um, and if we go here, just let's do it on five we will see something interesting here. So we have a two stages in this application. Why one stage is we're writing to this uh, topic we call stage one. And in this case, this is a component that we have here called a, where is it, producer. Um, uh, it knows that this is Kafka producer and the type of span is, is producer. And um, span is actually the time, how long, I, I, I didn't mention this on, on the very beginning. So the span, it's a, it's a time how long it takes the one um, request to, to, uh, to, to, to perform. In this particular case, span time is like uh, zero, one millisecond. And in this case, span is a consumer. So two things that we see here. Already we're getting some of the useful information here. So we, we know that um, some of the data from the topic stage, um, let's see. So let me go ahead and refresh and show you what kind of topics we have here. Okay. Um, stage one, this is the topic that we're using to, um, 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 where is that uh, overview? And I can see that what kind of messages here. It's just the same messages that I'm, I'm populating here. I can see it here as well. Now, so now I want to do uh, something useful. So I will start doing things like um, performing my queries. So in this particular case, um, never go to demo without um, pre <laughs> predefined queries. So you need to close your eyes for a second and like I kind of like a fast typing, 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 and boom, here we go. So I'm creating this uh, small application that will allow me to operate with this so-called stream. So I materialize this topic into something that can operate. In this particular case, we call it a stream. So when I run this, it uh, creates a stream over here. This stream, I can do queries. So one of my favorite queries is select star from everywhere. And now this query will be able to uh, print out all the result from this, uh, from this particular topic. Um, some, some magic is happening. Hopefully it's happening. Uh, hmm, let's, see. Let, let's just see, like we can always see what is uh, going on, why it's not running. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Interesting. Let me see if I can do this again. Okay, run. Check connection settings. Okay, so probably something is not right. Uh, go on again. Yeah, Kisigal server is up, is, is up and running, it's working. So um, everything is up, but for some reasons uh, the uh, control center cannot cannot connect to this one. Let me see. Try and again. Try and again. Always um, persistence. Uh, just try and try and try, and we'll, something will happen. Hopefully. Uh, let me see. My application is continue is still running. Yes, application is still running. We still have some data, um, which is also totally fine. We can uh, we can always switch from the fancy UI. We can switch to KSQL. Uh, to command line tools that will always show, okay, show streams, okay, select star from stage one, whatever, and uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay, let's see, drop stream. Uh, let's see, we'll, we'll try it again. It's always, 
Okay, so show. Okay, it's not there. Okay, try try and again. Uh, topic, page one. Uh, I will go and just query in uh, case SQL uh, stream name or wrapper. Um, when coding, uh, it's JSON, a integer, say stream. All right, so come on, come on, do it, do it, do it. Yes, it's working. So it, it does pushing some data. Now, can we see this, how these two application actually interacting? So I'm getting back here um, into, um, into my uh, Jaeger and uh, let's see. So first of all, I can see now the service registered here. I have a uh, five, six fine traces. And now I can see things from how the data arrived here. So data goes into, from the application goes to stage one. Next, it goes to, uh, we're reading from stage one. And from stage one, we're also doing reads for other, other, other queries. So let me show you a couple more um, cascading uh, streams. So in this case, I guess I will just uh, uh, stage one, stop run successfully. Now we should be able to see. So I created another stream. So in this particular case, I created stream stage two from another stream. So it's kind of like a, I'm trying to create a cascade and show how the um, this uh, this yeah pipeline can 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 be used to investigate what is going on here. So find traces, see Spring Boot, something is data is not there yet uh, here. So in this case, we have already multiple stages. So we have, uh, uh, we have data that produced in Spring Boot. We see data that was consumed from Spring Boot. Now we have another application that used the same uh, kind of like a trace, trace ID and they understand this is a part of the same transaction. They, this, we can now go and drill data down and down and down. So, um, this is uh, this is pretty much it. Um, uh, quickly, um, if you in this uh, the Kafka type of jazz, um, we actually doing the Kafka summit in in a couple of weeks. If you are local or if you're interesting to to come, um, you can use my personal uh, discount. It gives you 40 percent. And that would be it. Um, I will post the slides and the post the code uh, in Twitter. So you should go follow me. I'm a very interesting person. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for, so much for sticking up. Uh, and uh, I'm available for advanced interrogation as soon as I will clean up this place. Thank you so much.